there welcome to today's video my name is Prabhjot Kaur and in this video we're going to study a topic called vector quantization please note that vector quantization is used in several other domains such as signal processing so this video is going to be a general introduction on vector quantization so I'll start off with the background and motivation as to why even bother study vector quantization for speech processing then we'll discuss what is quantization specifically i want to focus on vector quantization which is where we will spend most of the time in today's video and then i will conclude referencing some of the papers in deep learning space that use quantization to give you an idea of how important this topic is so i have been studying papers I have been reading papers in speech processing recently and a lot of papers specifically these three they kept mentioning vector quantization and terms such as discrete representation product quantization code book code word code vector so it became apparent that i need to learn what is vector quantization before i understood what these papers were about so that's the whole motivation for me to understand this topic and to make this video to understand vector quantization, we will first start off with basics. So what is quantization? Quantization is a really old topic. And according to one of the famous paper called Quantization by Robert Gray, it's formally defined as the division of a quantity into discrete number of small parts. Or we can say conversion of a stream of analog or high rate discrete data into stream of low rate data now these definitions may seem abstract to you if it's the first time you're hearing the word quantization so we'll we'll go through the examples and maybe that should help as an example let's say we are given a signal it could be a speech signal or any other kind of signal now this is the continuous time analog signal uh, by the way, if you want to learn more about signals, like what type of signals, I would highly suggest you to go through one of my earlier videos where we discuss very basics of signals. So in, 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 in what, I, what I described there, this would be a continuous time analog signal. Now, in order to transmit this signal or store this signal, we have to first discretize this signal. We have to convert it in uh, convert it from a continuous time to a discrete time so that's called sampling so we sample the signal and now you can ignore the original signal because that's not what we are going to be transmitting or storing we are going to actually store or transmit the sampled version of the signal so now in order to represent this sampled signal which is these yellow lines we uh, we see that how many uh, these yellow uh, yellow lines these have uh, 16 distinct values on the y-axis meaning so at this time the value of the signal is this value and at this time the value of the signal is this amplitude at this time value is this amplitude so if we count all of these there are actually 16 of these samples of the signal and there are 16 unique values so to represent this signal we need at least four bits because four bits uh, give us 16 different combinations so that's why we need four bits so we need four bits in order to represent this sample signal which is not bad because just four bits however this is a very simple example in practical life the signals have more variable they, they have very high variability we will actually have more than 16 distinct values so this number four bits is going to grow exponentially so that's where the quantization comes into play now what is quantization quantization what we do is we say rather than sending these unique values at at every time i want to restrict how i represent my signal so then we define something called levels 
on the y-axis. So each of this is one distinct value. And we will use only these, in this case, seven. We will only use seven distinct values to represent all of this signal. So remember, these are 16 unique values. But, but we say that we want to restrict the representation of the signal to these seven new values, which we call levels. So then that's what, then we start quantizing our signal. So what we mean by that is we take each of these yellow lines, which is our original sample signal, and we map it to one of these levels that we have now defined. And this process is called quantization. Now, why do we need to do this? So if we look here, after we have quantized the signal, meaning we have mapped each of those yellow lines to one of these levels, now we only need to represent seven distinct values, which are represented by these, these levels here. So in order, to, in order to represent seven unique values, how many bits do we need? We need only three bits. So we have compressed the signal. We previously, we, we needed at most, at least four bits. Here we need just three bits. Now this may not sound like a lot of reduction because we went from four bits to three bits. But like I said before, this is a toy example. In practical life, the signals have high variability. We, when we do quantization, we will get a benefit of a reduction. Uh, which we call compression of the signal. So this is what quantization is. Now, there are types of quantization. One is called vector quantization. One is called scalar quantization. What we saw in the previous slide was scalar quantization. Why? Because we, at every time step, we were taking one value, which is a scalar, and mapping it to another scalar. So here I take I, I took the value, whatever the uh, yellow signal was here, and I mapped it to this one. And here, whatever the value y, um, yellow signal was, I, I mapped it to another scalar. So we're mapping scalar to scalar. That's why it's called scalar quantization. Vector quantization, on the other hand, which is the topic of interest, is nothing but similar to scalar quantization. We are here mapping a given vector to another set of vectors. So that's the difference. Again, what I just said. So for vector quantization, we, are t we, we have a given vector and we want to map that vector into a set of predefined vectors. Those predefined vectors are called code words or code vectors or templates. And then set of those code words is called a code book. Let's take a look again, one more time. So let's say we are given a scalar. So let's say this is a scalar. And then here we have a set of scalars, which we call levels. And then we, for the scalar quantization, we map this scalar to one of these other scalars or levels. And this, let's say we map it to this one. So then this is called scalar quantization. Vector quantization, on the other hand, it, we have a vector. Let's say it is one, two, three, four, five, five dimensional vector. And we want to map it to another set of vectors, which we call code words or code vectors. And they have to be of the same dimension as the vector that we want to quantize. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. So each of this is called a code word or code vector. And together, they form something called a code book. So each one is a code vector. So then we map this given vector to one of these code vectors. Let's say we map it to the first one, and this is called vector quantization. We'll look at some more examples. So 
let's proceed. Here, just the repetition of what I uh, showed in the previous slide. One more thing to note is uh, one thing that I haven't discussed yet is something called a Voronoi region. Be uh, because in a code book, we only have a set of limited set of vectors. Now, let's say we want to represent this given space by a limited set of vectors, which we called, which we call code vectors. So in order to do that, we divide this space into regions called Voronoi region. And each of these Voronoi region is nothing but the space that is represented by a given code word. What I mean by that is, so let's take and let's take a look at this one. So these uh, yellow, uh, the red dots are all called code vectors or code words, and these crosses are the vectors that we are trying to map. So each of these code word is going to have a space around it, which is its its neighborhood space. And if anything, any other vector falls into this space, then then we use this code word to represent all of these vectors that are in that space. So that's what the Voronoi region is. And how do we do this? How do we do? How do we know whether this vector is close to this vector or is it close to this vector? So that's that's the process of vector quantization. And how do we do that? We will study in a little bit. Let's take an example. So in this example, these we define a set of code vectors. Here, each of these black is called is a code vector. So the first one is negative, negative two, negative one, negative one, 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 and two. So these are four code vectors, one, two, three, four. And together, they form something called a code book. So now, let's say we are given two new vectors and we want to quantize these vectors. So what we'll do is we'll take this vector and we will find which one of these code vectors is the closest to this vector. And the way we do that is through, we can use a Euclidean difference, so a Euclidean distance. So we are just comparing two vectors. We're comparing this vector which, with each of these vectors and whichever gives us the minimum distance, then we say this vector is closest to that particular code vector. In this case, it's one, one. So we will represent this vector by this vector. So that's what vector quantization is. It's nothing but mapping of a vector to uh, one of the vectors in the code book. And here what you see is just the overall structure. So we have an encoder that does the mapping. And then we have a decoder that decodes what was the original vector from the uh, from that what that was sent over during transmission so this is just a simple example now we in the previous slides we mentioned about code book a few times but how do we create the code book so let's dive into that a little bit more when we create a code book things to consider is that the size of the code book must be reasonable because we have to store this code book statically. And then another important thing is the code book or the code vectors in the code book, they must represent our training data. That's really important. So what we mean by that is, let's say our training data contains human speech. And let's say the code vectors contain other types of audio such as um, telephone uh, bell or bird songs or things like that things that are completely unrelated to the to the uh, human speech right so that now that that code book would not be good for the data that we want to represent because our data is human speech and the code book is completely different so that's what we mean by that code book it should represent the training data because that otherwise it's meaningless now in order to create the code book it usually happens in two steps so first we have a initial code book and the initial code book can be created in different ways 
one of the thing one of the ways is to we just pick random vectors um so we just start with random and then we optimize that code book using something called k-means clustering uh, you probably know about this algorithm already so then we optimize the initial code book uh, and then once we have optimized then we can use that code book for our uh, model I would suggest reading through this paper if you have a chance here if you really want to implement vector quantization I, I this book would be really good to understand how you can implement vector quantization from scratch other things to consider is how do we measure the quality of the code book so similar to what we uh, what i said in the previous slide we want we want to have a code book that represents our training data so how do we measure the quality so we we use here mean squared error uh, other things that are important is what are the challenges so for all of these i would suggest uh, if you have a chance to go through this link here so here you will actually find now that you hopefully have got some idea about what is vector quantization if you read through this page you will see that this is a really good explanation of vector quantization and it also talks about other topics as to how to create the code book and how to optimize the code book and what are the challenges so i would suggest you go through that now the last part of this video is about how is vector quantization being used in deep learning there are three papers that are that i highlighted in the beginning of the video so once again this is a paper called vqvae very popular paper this is not specifically for speech processing but it, this methodology could also be used for speech processing so in this is just the architecture of the model called vqvae and here it uses the vector quantization uh, as you can see uh, this q and this codebook so this is where they use vector quantization as part of their model then secondly we have another paper for speech processing called vq wave to vec so this vq is nothing but vector quantization and in this case this q is what vector quantization is and and now you that under now you un, now that you understand vector quantization this paper will make more sense if you read through it now finally this is a very recent paper just released in 2023 by microsoft and this is for speech synthesis and here again they use vector quantization these vq1 vq2 vq3 these are vector quantization so this is how vector quantization is used recently in deep learning so it's not used as standalone it's integrated as part of other things in the model these are some of the resources that i will share with you uh, in this video and if you would like to study more details about vector quantization these are really good resources some of these are actual research papers and some of these are um, blogs and some of these are videos uh, so just whatever you want to it depends how deeper you want to go from here so i wish you luck with that i would like to say thank you for listening to me trying to explain this vector quantization it was really intimidating for me in the beginning but it's not that hard once we understand what's behind vector quantization it's not that difficult hopefully this video was helpful if you enjoy the videos on my channel please consider subscribing or sharing these videos with other people that's the best way you could help me so thank you for now i'll see you in the next video bye